Hello. Jonathan? Hey, hi. Hey, this is Justin Cantor of soulmusic.com. How are you today? How are you? I'm doing great. And you? I'm doing pretty well. I've been uh, listening to the CD a lot. Have you been busy That's promoting good. it? <laughs> <laughs> so the, yes, I have been. Yeah. Well, so tell me about it, because uh, after releasing a number of primarily jazz and gospel albums during yes. the last decade, what made you decide yeah. to make another R&B-driven album? Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, I, I have, I have uh, at the time, I had two record deals, one with a, a, a Christian label and, and one with Rendezvous Records, and then Rendezvous got, you know, uh, then Mac Avenue, and uh, so contractually, I was, um, I had, I had two parallel, parallel careers going here, uh, and and I had to, um, of course, I had to do another album for uh, my, for Mac Avenue, and uh, and my thoughts were um, not to do a smooth jazz record. I I didn't want to go down that road. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I really wanted to kind of, you know, go back to uh, where I started. I wanted to make an urban album. I wanted to sing a lot more on the album. I I didn't want to. Uh, um, that's why there's only four instrumentals on the album because I, I really wanted to, um, you know, sing and 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 it, and also even even in terms of the instrumentals, I I just decided to play more electric guitar than you know than acoustic guitar, mm -hmm. uh, which people know me a lot more for. So and I just wanted to make something fun, you know. Uh, I, I wanted the album to be fun and flavorful and and feel good and you know I really wanted that type of record and. Uh, this is why that that's and this is why I ended with it. And yeah. when you mentioned "Do You Love Me," that reminded me because uh, I went to Berkeley College of Music, and wow. I remember you came to do a clinic when I was there about the time that album, that, that album was released. Yeah, because that was like yeah. during my first semester, so that kind of had an impact. So on how me. old were you then? How old were you then? I was well, I was nineteen then. Oh, so <laughs> that's a while ago. Because a good friend of mine, Carl Beatty, was. Uh, one of the professors there. Oh, really? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I had him, but uh, I did study uh, with uh, Walter Beasley. If you're familiar. Oh yeah, with him. yeah, yes, yeah, yes, great, great some, guy. Yeah, there's some really fabulous instructors there that I learned a lot from. Uh, yes. So, what was the recording process like for this album? Uh, where did you record it? Um, in my how, studio, at ho in my home studio. Okay. I, I basically did everything. I, I, you know. I have a studio. I use Logic and um, and, and I use Apogee converters. Oh, um, Apogee, okay. And I use uh, uh, you know um, Neve mic preamps and uh, and basically I did the record at home. I did everything at home. I played bass. I played the keys. I I, I you know I programmed everything um, except for a few cuts. Uh, Gordon Campbell, a great drummer, uh, did some um, did a couple of drum tracks for me. And, um, and, 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 you know, did my vocals here. We even had a, a sort of a 12 piece choir in my living room and oh, mic really? them up and, and, uh, we were able to get that done with, um, you got to believe in something. And, uh, um, what is the other song? Um, I can see clearly now. Oh yeah. You know? so, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So, um, is it something when you're doing it at home, like, where there's a lot of overdubbing or do you do parts of it live as far as different instruments together or when you're playing different things, you know, how does that all work? Well, once I got the tracks, you know, once I got the basic, basic tracks together, like drums and percussion and keyboards and the bass, I play live bass on quite a, probably most of it is all live bass with some synth bass stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and then I'll just overdub as I go, you know, mm -hmm. I work pretty quickly on my own. I, I mean, I sort of know exactly where everything is where, you know, and I have, I have specific, like for me, meat and potato stuff that I use all the time. And so I don't waste a lot of time trying to, you know, and maybe, maybe it's because I'm getting older that I'm not as fussy and, mm -hmm. you know, and choosy and picky and, right. you know, um, like I'm not trying to just go for perfection. I want it to feel right, and if it feels good and if it sounds good, then I'm okay with it. You know, sometimes a lot of the vocals you'll hear are demo vocal performances that I've done on the album, and I wanted oh, yeah? to go back. To like, like uh, I'm right here was a demo vocal. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Color green was a demo vocal. Actually, most of the vocals I never really, you know, the only vocal I think I really sort of thought a lot about 
doing right was uh, the duet with Angie Stone because uh, you know uh, we were in the same room together. So recording. okay, yeah, I was going to ask you so, about that. That's so cool. I had to like, you know, we were like looking at each other as we were singing the uh -huh. song. So I knew I had to kind of you know match her performance or. Uh, get you know finesse the lyric a little more, um, mm -hmm. but most of the time when I'm recording in my studio, I I'm totally free. You know, mm -hmm. I don't really think of perfection and oh god, the, the, this this doesn't sound right to me. You know, um, you mentioned the fact that you started out performing live at a young age, so um, yeah, I was gonna just go back a little bit if you wouldn't mind to the beginnings of your musical journey. Um, yeah, because the world at large first got acquainted with your talents through recordings like uh, African Breeze with Hugh Masakela yes. and If You're Ready with uh, Ruby Turner. Um, yes. But in fact, you've been making records in your home country of South, of South Africa since you were a kid. Um, yeah. And what, from what I understand, you were the first black artist there to be played on white radio stations during the apartheid yes. days. So, uh, you know, how did you uh fall into music at such a young age and what are your memories of those early days starting out you know i i you know god had a plan oh, god has a plan you know i mean i i i grew up in a musical family i mean my mother was uh my father and my brothers and sisters were all musicians you know and i and when i opened my eyes i I, you know, I had to sit around listening to my brothers and sisters talk about their travels and, you know, tours and mm -hmm. and where they played. And, you know, uh, Cape Town was a very vibrant city, is a very vibrant city with carnival every year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, but in the beginning, I was extremely shy as a kid. I didn't want to really sing in front of <laughs> anybody, but I knew I knew that I, I just had a, I just had a knowing inside that I because I would sing for myself. I would sing for my, you know, maybe my friends on the street or, you know, and and I, I took an early interest in guitar too because my older brother, my late brother, um, he was uh, he was a genius on guitar. I mean, he was like the George Benson, you know. Oh, yeah. Before I, before I knew who George Benson was. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I knew of Cecil. You know, <laughs> I knew he was the guy, you know. What and was so, his name? Cecil. Cecil, but okay. We used, to call him, we, we used to call him Ponty, you know. Ponty, uh, okay. P-O-A. Ponty, you know, and he was he was known in the city by all musicians in in the community that he was he was known. He was he was an amazing guy, and my brother Danny, he was a great. He's still singing and still traveling. And my sister Sandra and Vicky, um, everybody was playing. Paul, Ian, Veronica, everybody was doing some kind of music thing. So, so they were all somewhat on a professional level in Cape Town, is what you're saying. Back in the day, I I, I wouldn't say all of them were on a professional stage, but. Mm -hmm. Definitely Danny and Vicky and Sandra and, and Ponty, my older brother. Okay. And so I really loved, you know, I really loved music. And, and I think uh, one day I, they, re they heard me sing and, and, and my mother and I, I remember they, we used to kind of do community concerts and variety shows and, and I was featured. And, um, and that was the end. That was, that, that's where it all began. I got on stage and I sang Delilah. Mm -hmm. by Tom Jones and, 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 and everything was a wrap after that. I mean, people threw, like in Africa, if they like you, they throw money on stage. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and once I got that, once I saw the money on the stage, I was like, oh, my goodness, I think this is what I want to do forever. <laughs> <laughs> when you first became internationally successful um, with, on Jive Records and you were working with Barry J. Eastman on now classics like Take Good Care of Me, uh, Lies, yes. Heal Our Land, all that good stuff. Um, yes. w was it a natural progression for you musically or was it, I mean, what do you think when you look back at the beginnings of your like big commercial success from that time period? Well, I tell you what, I got to, I got to take my hats off and, and, and thank Clive Calder for, you know, uh, playing such an incredible role in me developing as a songwriter because I, I, when I joined, when I joined Jive UK, and and it was when I flew into England, I mean I was uh, Jive had five writing rooms, and you know I, and they teamed me up with Johnny and Skinner, and all we did was write. We mm -hmm. wrote every day, and Clive was always there to listen to the tracks and you know give his opinion and and direction. Um, I remember when we wrote uh, "Take Good Care of Me." It was uh, I think Clive we sort of had a discussion about. We were talking about, you know, a man saying, take good care of me to a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, usually it's the woman saying, take good care of me to the man. Right. And Clive, had this, 
he had this great twist on the story. Like, you know, this would be a great story if you say, take good care of me from a man's perspective. Mm-hmm. 